This last message that I want to share is entitled Growing in Grace. And the subtitle is Our High Calling. Our High Calling. And I want to begin by addressing our high calling. So if you have your Bible, let us open up to Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Ephesians chapter 4. We'll open with verse 7. It says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Our high calling. What is our high calling? Anyone want to venture a guess? Don't be afraid. Be like Jesus. Yes, Jesus is our high calling. I talk about growing in grace. And the question is, well, what is grace? When we speak about growing in grace, we want to know what grace is, right? I think that would be a logical question. Well, let's answer what grace is. How does that sound? Sound like a good thing to you? Let's begin in 1 Corinthians. Chapter 1, we'll look at a few different texts, see what the scripture tells us with regard to grace, the source of grace. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and the fourth verse. Here the Apostle Paul writes, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. According to this verse, where does grace come from? Who is the source of grace? Ultimately, yes. But through whom do we receive this grace? Through Jesus Christ. That's right. Now turn with me to the book just prior to this, Romans, the fifth chapter. And we'll read verse 15. Romans 5, 15. There we read, But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one man, or of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God, and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So again, here we see the same truth, don't we? Here it speaks of the free gift. What is that free gift? It's Jesus. Jesus is that free gift. Through him, we receive grace. And we will see this more in our next couple of verses. The first is John chapter 1. And we'll be reading the 14th verse. Here the Apostle John writes, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace. Complete supply of grace we find in Jesus Jesus is the source of our grace. But more than this, turn with me to Titus chapter 2. The glory of God is seen in his Son. Titus, I'll get there eventually. Chapter 2.
Beginning in verse, we'll begin in verse, let's see, 10. Actually, back up to verse 8. The apostle says, Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. Who is this grace of God that hath appeared unto all men? It's Christ Jesus. That's right. Through him, we receive all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 4. Learning what grace is and more appropriately who grace is. What grace is is not so important as who grace is. Ephesians chapter 4. In verse 7 we read that unto every one of us is given grace. No one here lacks grace. The Lord said unto Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. Every one of us has been given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. No one of here in this room or anyone in this world lacks grace. Grace hath abounded unto all men. He has provided unto all, but especially unto his church has God provided special measure of grace because there is a special work to be done for the salvation of souls. So God has provided special grace. And I want us to read, beginning, well, we read verse 7. Let's read from thence on for several verses. Let's see what the purpose of this grace which has been delivered unto his church is for. Beginning in verse 8. It says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended... What is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended, up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Are you starting to see what this grace is and who this grace is? Who is filling all things? He that was descended into the earth, was buried, and ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. That is his grace. It's the impartation of his spirit, our high calling. He continues, verse 11, And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. These gifts that God has provided, you can read more about them in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The specific gifts, although I do not believe God has enumerated all the gifts which he has bestowed upon his church, many of them are there. And these gifts are given for our high calling, and these callings are here mentioned. If you read in verse 1, Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are what? Called. The word vocation is calling. Every one of us has received a calling, a vocation. And God hath given gifts to fit us for that calling. And these gifts are here enumerated. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. These are the different callings within the church. And God has given gifts to fit men to fulfill these callings. Why? What are the purpose of these callings? Let's read in verse 12 and onward. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. For what? Yes, for the perfecting of the saints. We're all saints, aren't we? Are we all perfect? No. 
That's what our high calling is for. That's what growing in grace is all about. It's for the perfecting of the saints. The gifts which God gave are to perfect us in love. They are the gift of Christ. It's the gift of himself to his church. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Christ is with us. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is our high calling. The gifts are meant to bring us into the fullness of the stature of the image of God in Christ. That is the purpose of the gifts, to perfect us. And what is perfection? Jesus. We cannot have a lower standard. No man is a standard for us to attain, but Christ Jesus alone. He is the standard of perfection. And therefore, he has given us his spirit to bring us unto that perfection. Only his spirit can accomplish that work. And he has given it in abundance, the full measure unto each and every one of us. Paul likens it into a race. You know, those who enter into the Olympic races, he was speaking to the Corinthians, which were in that time, they had the Olympic races, which everybody wanted to strive for because it carried with it great honors. And they went to no lengths to train for these Olympic races. They would train themselves and, and go through all kinds of strenuous uh, training to prepare themselves for these races. But they did it to win a corruptible crown. Only one man could win that laurel, the Olympic laurel. But Paul says, all who run the race in Christ win. Run to win. Don't run to lose. He says, so run I. As one who is going to win, we must run to win. Remember what I said earlier about talking your faith, living your faith? Run to win. Put forth the effort to win. Don't settle for anything less than perfection. Set your eyes on Jesus. Look to him. Run to him and you will win. Only one man can win an earthly race, but all who run the race in Christ Jesus win. The only one who can fail is one who doesn't cross the line. If you fall back or you pull away or you give up, that's the only way you can lose. Everyone who crosses the line wins in a mortal crown. They do it for a corruptible, said Paul, but we for an incorruptible that fadeth not away. The gifts which God gives are for the perfecting of the saints. And that image of perfection is Christ Jesus. It's for the work of the ministry. Christ has provided for the work necessary to perfect us within the church. How are we going to bring the world to perfection? How are we going to call the world out of of the world, if we are in the world. You've heard of the fourth angel's message, come out of her, my people. How can you call them out if you are in? You ever thought of that? Come out of her, my people. You're calling them to where you are. You have to be out of Babylon to call them out of Babylon. That's the purpose of the gifts which God has given he wants to rid us of all worldliness. That is the purpose of the second angel's message. Babylon has fallen. How does Babylon fall? But by not being in you. If it has no place in your heart, Babylon is fallen. Otherwise, Babylon is alive if it lives in you. If you want Babylon to fall, let Christ purge it out of your heart. If you want to be perfect, let him purge that worldliness from you. That's why he's given these gifts to his church, given them a work to do. The work begins with us. Are we going to try to remove the mote of our brother's eye when we have a beam in our own? Folly. For the edifying of the body of Christ. 
Verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. That is our high calling. And Jesus is that high calling. He is our banner. He is the standard which we must set. We can set our eyes no lower if we want to be perfect. We must look unto Jesus. We must receive from him. Jesus gave the example of the plant as it grows. You know, it's planted into the ground and first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. At every stage in the development of that plant, as long as it is receiving the tender care of the husbandman, it is perfect. It hasn't borne fruit yet. But at every stage, as long as it is receiving from the husbandman as it provides that which nourishes the plant, and that plant continues to grow, it is perfect at every stage. And so are ye. So am I. As long as I am receiving from Christ, I am perfect. As long as I am living in the light that he has given me, the knowledge that he has bestowed upon me, I am perfect. God is perfect in his fear, but he knows all things. To him, all things are possible, so he is eternally perfect. Perfect in the broadest sense of the word. But I don't know all things. I don't have all power. I am limited by what light and knowledge I have. Therefore, perfection in a human sense is determined by the light and knowledge we have. As long as we are receiving the gifts which Christ is bestowing upon us freely, we are perfect. The prophet Hosea said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. But it's not that God has not provided, for he continues and says, because ye have rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. You see, it's not that God hasn't provided the nourishment that we need. It's that we have rejected it when it has come, for whatever reason. That is the only thing that stunts our growth as Christians. God is the husbandman. Jesus said, I am the vine. My father is the husbandman. He provides that nourishment through me. And as long as you are attached to me, you will thrive and you will one day bear fruit. It's inevitable. If we remain attached to Christ, if we receive from him that which God hath provided for the nourishment of his people, the gospel is all throughout the Bible, beloved. God has provided for the perfecting of the saints, and that perfection is Jesus. Turn with me to 1 Peter. We'll take our leave of, of Paul, which we've spent ex extensively in, but we're going to take a look now at the second epistle of Peter. I want to spend the remainder of our time here. I love this epistle. And I think the more you read it prayerfully, asking God to give you wisdom and understanding, the more precious it will become to you as well. We'll begin in verse 1. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, 
having escaped the corruption that is in the world. God wants to unite his nature with ours. He wants us to be partakers of the divine nature. And he's given unto us the spirit of his son, whereby we may cry, Abba, Father. He's given the spirit of his son that we might be partakers of the divine to bring us into the perfection of what God intended every man to be. And the verses that follow are beautiful. Let's read them together. I'll go over them. This is our high calling. It's what I call growing in grace. Through the grace of Christ, we grow and climb Jacob's ladder, rung by rung. And each of these steps is, as I think beautifully noted here by the Apostle Peter, beginning in verse 5. He speaks in verse 4 of these precious promises that by these promises we might be partakers of the divine nature and escape the corruption that is in the world through lust, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the lust of the eyes. And he says here in verse 5, and beside this, beside these precious promises, he says, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And he begins to list what I call our high calling. It is a step-by-step growth in grace, each one building upon another. The basis, the foundation of it all is what? Faith. Adding to your faith, he says, which every man has. God has given to every man the measure of faith. We all have faith, but we must build. We are to be builders, building an edifice. We are temples for the indwelling of the Spirit of God. And we are to build. And this building is outlined here by the Apostle Peter. We are to add to that faith which we have been given virtue. Well, what is virtue? You know what the word virtue means? But it, not only as we use it in English, but also in the original. The word virtue in English comes from the Latin vir, man. It literally means manly. That's what virtue is. We are to become men. And that applies not only to men, but mankind. It's the ideal image of what God created Adam to be, an upright, noble man. It's the manly traits, the strength that we have, not physical strength alone, but especially the moral strength. We must add to our faith virtue. When you think of virtue, you think of those things that set a man apart, what make him virtuous. It's the manly qualities, and women possess them too. We are to add to our faith virtue. We are to become men. We must grow a backbone. We must be willing to stand for the right, willing to do the right, though the heavens fall. We must be men. We must be willing to fight the good fight. These are virtues, and we must add to our faith virtue. We must become men and women of God sons and daughters of God. God wants us to realize who we are and what we are, the measure of our high calling, the privilege that we have to be called his sons, and he wants us to carry ourselves as that. Remember who you are. You are a son and daughter of God. Add to your faith virtue. And when you begin to stand as a man, as you've gained your faith, You come and you learn. That is why he says, and add to your virtue, what? Knowledge. As we come to church, we sit in Sabbath school, we listen to the messages, as we read our Bibles, we are gaining knowledge. We are learning doctrine. That is the next step. We begin to learn the truth. Once we have become men, we begin to study for ourselves, we begin to eat for ourselves. Not our Are we receiving instruction from our pastors, from our teachers? As we sit and listen to the message and as we sit in Sabbath school, we are learning knowledge. 
We are gaining knowledge. We are adding to it. That is as much a part of Christian perfection. Doctrine is important. It's a part. It's one of those stones laid on the foundation. We must gain knowledge. Knowledge is power. And that's why we must add to our knowledge what? Temperance. What is temperance? Self-control. Because knowledge is power, as we gain knowledge, we must be men of self-control. We don't use our knowledge to abuse. We don't use it as a cloak to cover sin. We are men and women of God. As we learn, we must gain self-control. That's why the Apostle James said, my brethren, in, in chapter 3, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. The more you know, the more you're responsible for. The more self-control you need. That's why we must add to our knowledge temperance. Do you understand? This is a step-by-step -step process. It's growing in grace. Everything builds upon another. The basis, the foundation of it all is faith. Then we become men and women. And we learn. We learn of Christ through his word. The entrance of thy word giveth light. Yea, it giveth understanding unto the simple. Psalm 119, 130. God has provided that knowledge for us, but realize the more we know, the more we are responsible for, and we must be men of self-control. Add to your knowledge temperance, and to temperance, patience. It's the next step in Christian growth. As you learn self-control, you must learn patience. Well, what is patience? Patience is learned through enduring hardship and trial. Patience is simply endurance. The more you learn, the more you're going to see. The more trials and troubles you're going to have. The more difficulties you're going to face. Ignorance can be bliss because you're not aware, but the more you learn, as the light of truth floods into your soul, you see it. Sin begins to trouble you. You are vexed by it as you see it around you. You suffer under the consequences of your own actions. Patience is necessary in Christian growth. We must endure trials. He that endureth unto the end shall be saved. That's patience. It's enduring our trials. Look at the example of Abraham, the trial that he had in offering up his son. He had to endure unto the end. He had to be patient and wait upon God, and the answer came. And we too must learn patience. We must learn to endure, not with sorrow, not with a frown, but cheerfully. Just as Christ bore our sins. For the joy that was set before him, he took his cross, despised the shame, and is now set down on the right hand of the throne of God on high. And we too must count it all joy. We must know that it's but for a season, and all will work together for our good. We must live by faith, and patience is an integral part of that. As we gain knowledge and self-control, we must also learn patience. It is the next step. But what comes after patience? Godliness. You've been feeding on the Word of God. You're a man. You have those human qualities that make you a man those good qualities that God instilled in the very nature of man, which is what virtue is. But here are the godly qualities, godliness. We add to our patience godliness. As we learn and read the word of God, we apply those things in our lives, we begin to develop the qualities of God in us. We begin to partake of the divine nature. Godliness simply means God-likeness. It's being like God. 
It's the next step. Through patience, we become like God. How long has God borne? How long has he endured our sin, our waywardness, patiently? If we want to be like him, the next step after patience is godliness. It's inevitable. If we endure, if we persist in self-control and standing, being men, and we walk in the, the light of the knowledge that God has given us, we will become like him. These are the steps that follow in one another. Godliness has to follow patience. As we endure, we become like him. We learn to bear with the follies of those around us. We learn to uplift the weak. We learn to love, to help those who are weak, those who are struggling. We have learned through patience to be like God. We don't press them down. We're not like crabs in a bucket. We are to uplift our fellow man, not pull them down. That's being like God. God wants to lift us up to his level. God doesn't want to sit exclusively. He wants to make us like him, to be partakers of his nature. Therefore, he has given us these steps whereby we may become like him, godlike, godly. It is the next step. The progressive step in growing in grace. As Christ abides in you, this will follow. And what do we add to our godliness? These two final ones are the capstones that garnish that temple and truly make it beautiful. Brotherly love brotherly kindness. The word there in the Greek is Philadelphia. It literally means brotherly love. And to help you understand what that is, it's not something necessarily easily explained, but I think the best object lesson as brothers, those men who have gone to war together, those men who've entrusted their lives to another, they develop a special bond. It's a brotherhood. It's brotherly love. When you entrust your life to your, your friend, your, he becomes a brother in a special way. Someone who you know you can count on to have your back in all things. It's brotherly love. It's the church of Philadelphia. And that is to exist among us. Do you have each other's back? Or are we backbiting and chewing on one another? Are we eating away at our brother and sister? Or do we watch out for them? Do we have them? Can they trust their life to us? Because that's what brotherly kindness is. It's the next step. As we become like God, we must learn to uphold one another. It's edifying the body of Christ. Do we love one another? We have no place admonishing unless we're willing to die for that person. If you're not willing to die for your brother, you have no place in admonishing him. None. Jesus showed you that. Jesus had all right to admonish because he gave his life for you. But unless you're willing to do the same, shut your lips. Uplift them. Help them. Encourage them. Pull them up higher. But don't push them down. Give your life for the flock. That's what Jesus said to Peter. Feed my sheep. He wants us to become like him. And these are the steps to becoming like God. That's why these verses are so precious. God inspired Peter to write out what is perhaps, I think, some of those beautiful words ever written to help us understand. It's so simple, and it's so short, yet it's so full of life, full of what we need to help us understand what it means to be like God. The secret is in these words. If we will ask, we will receive. God is no respecter of persons, 
He's not hiding from you what he wants you to be. He's expressed it to you plainly and clearly. And if we will ask him, he will reveal to us what it means. And he, I believe he's shown it to us through Peter. Add to your godliness, brotherly kindness. Take care of your brothers. Just as Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We are to have that care for one another, not to suffer our brother to sin, not to suffer him to languish in sorrow and pine away, not to suffer him to be ignored through his trials and difficulties, but we're to be there to uplift him, to point them to Jesus. We are our brother's keeper. And we must realize this. God has entrusted every one of us to everyone else. We belong to each other because we are the body of Christ. I don't separate my finger from my toe. We're all one body. I love my body. I love all of it. Do we love one another? Because we are the body of Christ. And if Christ be in us, we will love one another. And add to your brotherly kindness, charity, the capstone of it all. It's the height. It's the pinnacle of the temple of God. Love, charity. There is no higher calling. It is our high calling because God is love. That's why charity is the capstone. It's the last step. And when you love your brother, when you love God supremely, then you know you are his. You know. When love abides in you, and love abides in one another, we know that God lives because God is love. Love is that capstone. And he says, verse 8, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You will bear fruit. To his glory, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 13. I want to close by reading about charity. This was my grandmother's favorite chapter. She had it memorized. And we used to memorize it together. It is some of the most precious language given to us in the word of God. It expresses who and what God is. Beginning in verse 4. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly or inappropriately, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, which is another expression for meekness, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, Believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. Oh, that's so precious. Love can never fail. God cannot fail. Love will triumph. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, 
it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. It is the greatest of them because it comprises all of what God is. God is love. And it is expressed beautifully here in Corinthians 13. We saw it expressed in First Peter or Second Peter chapter one. But I tell you, this whole book is love. It's the record of God's acts toward men. And because God is love, everything that He has done for mankind is an expression of love. If you want to know what God is like, read His word. You will learn of Him. That is how we grow. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And how shall men hear if we are not sent? If we don't preach. If we don't preach the word of God. If we don't preach Jesus and Him crucified. We're not preaching the gospel. God wants to bring us to the fullness of the stature of Christ. But he can only do that if we are looking to him. If he is our pattern, if we are imitating him, we must grow in grace. Grow in Jesus. He's not simply a good name. It is the name above all names. It is the only name given among men whereby we must be saved. It is the most precious name ever. It is the sweetest name. Sweetest note in seraph song. Sweetest name on mortal tongue. Sweetest carol ever sung. Jesus, blessed Jesus. That is what he is to us. What I hope he will become for each and every one of us. May God bless you richly, abundantly, above all that you can ever think and hope for. Look to Jesus, beloved. Give your heart to him. Open your heart to him. Withhold nothing from him, for he withholdeth nothing from you.